Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/get100 and use code get100. That's code get100 at prizepicks.com/get100. For a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Welcome to the Meet the Man Union podcast season 4. I'm Deepa Thomas Sutcliffe, your friendly host. On the streets and nooks of Manchester, my inspiring Mancunian guests tackle their causes with their grit and passion. They are leaders, worker bees and community hosts, and they share their stories to inspire you all through the season. Relax, grab a brew, and listen in to the Meet the Mancunian on Apple, Google, Spotify or any of your favorite podcasting platforms. You can also check out all the episodes on my new website www.meetthemancunian.co.uk. Passionate about mindfulness? We hear from Natalie Rosetter, mindfulness and forest therapy coach in this episode. I'm delighted to introduce my guest Natalie Rosetter, therapist, mindfulness teacher and nature connection guide. Thank you so much Natalie for talking to me today. I'm looking forward to learning about all the different mindfulness techniques you're part of and it's of course it's World Mental Health Day that we're recording this on. Yeah. Uh so it'll be interesting to hear about that. How are you doing today? Oh, well, thank you for having me Deepa. Um yeah, I'm doing really well today. Thank you. Um had quite a busy but satisfying day and I even managed a little nap which is definitely a mental health <laughs> tip I would recommend <laughs> to anybody. Um and well done for getting all my various job titles in there as well. I do do lots of things but they're all linked together which I'm sure I'll explain in time. Lovely. So start with to start with tell us about your passion for well-being and mindfulness. How did that come about? So I was interested in sort of mental health and psychology from a young age really and um, we didn't have a psychology GCSE or anything like that at my school but I just did my own reading um so I suppose it kind of started there and then I kind of had a bit of a break in that it was you know like lots of young people figuring out life and what I wanted to do and um eventually I kind of heard about this training um doing some counselor training when i lived in bath and i went along to an open day and the rest as they say is history i think it came from a a kind of just a curiosity about my own well-being and understanding myself and then also wanting to understand others and i'd always been somebody who you know i could just sit down at a bus stop waiting for a bus and someone would sit next to me and just tell me their life story um and i would listen um you know and without judgment and usually with fascination um and compassion and uh, that sort of just came naturally to me and just happened <laughs> all the time that would happen so i thought well i'll just turn this into a career <laughs> I'll, i'll start charging for this um so yeah people would often come to me with their problems and i guess i um just felt compelled i wanted to help and so that's i became a therapist um and through my training i learned about mindfulness um really to support myself uh, it was very stressful i was working two jobs whilst doing my training as in my early 20s um so I was just trying to support myself whilst doing some studying um and that was a lot of hard work um and so i needed some stress management techniques and i found mindfulness i think a lot of people find mindfulness that way and the mindfulness led on to the nature connection because i would practice being mindful whilst out walking the dog in the morning before going to work and that was my favorite time of day you know just noticing the 
sun through the trees and things like that. And it all kind of came together for, for myself. And then I started to encourage other people to use these techniques. And that's really important to me that I wouldn't ever um, suggest things to people that haven't helped me or that I wouldn't use myself. And everyone's different. Not everyone likes the same techniques or they don't work for everybody. But that kind of authenticity of, oh, yeah, this isn't just something I've been told through my training to do or I've read in a textbook or something this is something I've lived through myself and I use this as well um, and I think people really like that approach they can tell when it's genuine yeah I think so and I think that personal experience that you're sharing probably gives people a lot of confidence especially when they're trying something that they may not be as familiar with to know that you know you're saying that I've tried this myself it's I went through a stressful time. Yes. It helped me with that stressful time. So that that does sound like a really interesting way to obviously test out the technique before you <laughs> share it with others. Exactly. So now uh, you said you're in many different uh, areas of mindfulness and well-being. And maybe start with the nature connection mm. guide because, you know, um, I had a guest some seasons ago where we talked about forest bathing as something they were going to get into nice. and obviously you said you're actually doing this so yeah. I'd be really interested in that and ever since I heard about it I've been you know every time I go for a walk with my family in the woods I'm just taking that the trees in even more but I'd love to learn from your side yeah so the forest therapy came about from sort of through the mindfulness and then doing some mindful walking, kind of learning about walking meditation um, came through that and then taking clients uh, for sessions outside when some people found that they couldn't kind of open up in a, a small space um, and that kind of thing. And so I started to feel again through my own experience, oh, there's something in this nature connection. And then so I just started looking it up and sort of reading and researching around it and discovered that it's a whole thing and it has this name and you know forest bathing is something that's been really well researched so it came from japan um, as a as a formal practice i mean it's it's global it's something inherent in all human beings um so there's a something called the biophilia principle which um a guy called eo wilson proposed and it just we, we know it. It just means it's a human being's innate tendency to want to connect with all living things. You know, so when a child bends down to look at a flower um, or collects a leaf or a conker or something like that, um, that's biophilia, you know, that we just we want to connect with other living things um, animals as well as plants. Um, and so, yeah, we that's it's across the world. Everyone sort of does forest bathing I always say that at the start of my forest bathing sessions you know who's done forest bathing before and either no one or like one person puts their hand up and I say actually it's not true you've all done it before but perhaps maybe when you were children um or any time when you've walked in the woods and just had a moment of you know or looking at the sunlight through the leaves or um a really cool mushroom or whatever it might be that you found on your walk um, essentially that's forest bathing it's just about immersing yourself in the natural environment for its well-being properties and let's say that kind of originated in Japan in the 80s sort of with the rise of technology um, the government noticed people were really stressed and they wanted something to kind of help out these stressed office workers city workers um, so they sent them off to the forest on their coaches and they would go off and of course because it was a government initiative and they do these guided walks they wanted to know if it was effective and so they started researching it and that's how it's kind of become you know a thing with a name um, and an evidence base um, which is really exciting and the research is really fascinating if you're into that kind of thing but it just basically proves what we innately know when we go into nature um, and we kind of have that mindful time where we're not even necessarily trying to go anywhere. So it's not like a, a hike where you're trying to get to a destination or do a certain amount of miles or anything like that. It's just a different way of being outside. You might not go very far at all, but it's about the depth of experience and just being really present and curious and joyful 
about what you see and hear and touch. That is so true. Sometimes it's just a change of environment from an indoor space to an outdoor space or seeing the sunlight after a day when you haven't. It's just uh, all I'm fascinated by sunrises and sunsets. So I can totally understand what you're saying. And that that sounds really, really, really nice. And what are the other things you're involved in? Uh, Do you want to talk about them? Yeah, so they, as I say, they all kind of link together um, and come from just that uh, sort of intention really to want to support people's well-being because there is no one size fits all for that. We need different things at different times, different people uh, kind of are drawn to different types of approaches and techniques. So um, my main job, I suppose, the bread and butter of what I do is counselling, talking therapy, and that can take place online or I work from a little therapy summer house in my garden where I see my in-person clients and that's really nice safe space for people to come um, and talk about what's on their minds and um, and so I, I offer an integrative approach which basically means I've done lots of different trainings and, and learnings about different ways of understanding human beings basically and what makes us tick and what helps us and all of this so again because everyone's different uh, I will apply different Approaches. So perhaps we'll focus on um, increasing compassion. Maybe we'll be wanting to understand relationship patterns. So we might work with attachment theory, these kinds of things. Um, and then I also teach mindfulness. So these can be one-to-one sessions or something I've been wanting to do for a while, which I set up a few months ago as an in-person mindfulness group in my local community. So I'm based in Salford. Um, not too far from the city centre from Manchester and um, yeah I really wanted a place especially after the pandemic where people could physically come and practice mindfulness together but with a a focus on mindfulness for modern life so the kind of practical application of mindfulness Um, so we'll talk about an aspect of mindfulness so for example tomorrow's session is about judgment and non-judgment and so we'll we'll discuss how that comes up in our life, uh, what we can do about it from a mindfulness perspective and do some guided meditation together. And I really love these sessions, just bringing people together. Um, so I try and offer a variety of things for, you know, um, I suppose a range of types of people, but also a range of budgets as well, because this is the problem with the sort of society that we live in. We know there's a mental health crisis so many people struggling in lots of different ways um but not everyone can afford to come for private therapy you know the nhs waiting list is very long and there are loads of fantastic um initiatives and charities and things like that but it's a shame when we have to rely on charities people who volunteer um and again they're not always available or accessible or again they have long waiting lists and things so um that's why i I run like the mindfulness group and why I create resources and share lots of content on social media as well. So I'm kind of trying to reach a kind of broad spectrum of people and I'm just one person, but I'm on a, a little mission to just in my little corner of the world, you know, I can share some information and I can offer some support and it just feels like a, a meaningful thing to do with my time really. And I hope Meet the Mancunian podcast can help you with your mission. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, so what impact have you made so far? Well, I suppose it's hard to kind of quantify that. But I was reflecting on this question earlier. And I suppose every now and then I have these little moments where I'm reminded of the impact that I make. I think it I find it easy to forget sort of what I do especially I've been a counsellor for 10 years now so it's just become normalised to me but every now and then I will hear from a a past client or um, or a present client will say something in a session and I'll have that moment of realisation of how someone's life has been completely changed not by me but by the work they have done through engaging either with counselling or by starting to practice mindfulness regularly or by learning to connect with nature and doing that regularly, whatever it is that I've helped them with and that improvement that's been made. And it's a real moment of kind of, it's quite humbling um, to, to realise kind of the impact that you can have sometimes just by doing 
really basic things like just being kind and listening to someone. I think I can forget the impact that that has, but over 10 years, obviously I've worked with hundreds of clients now. And so I guess that's a pretty good feeling to think, you know, that well, hundreds of people's lives have been improved in some small and in some very big ways, in some ways, you know, you never know for sure, but there's certainly been people who whose lives have been saved through the work that they've done through coming to therapy. Um, and so it's really nice for me to remember that actually. So thank you for asking me that question <laughs> because, um, yeah, it really reminds me that the work I do, which, you know, and some of the work I do is incredibly boring because it's like doing my accounts or, you know, all the admin, all the behind the, behind the scenes stuff that can sometimes seem like a slog, but it's all there to support those things where you are really making an impact. Um, so it feels thank like you for like sharing that. that. And I think, uh, you know, this is a question that, people answer in many different ways. It can be through the impact you make on people's lives, through uh, sometimes people share numbers. We, I leave it open to my guests to share, but I think just because we have these listener base from 40 different countries, it's really nice to bring that in just to showcase why uh, you know we're talking to you uh, here. Yeah. Yeah. I hope um, oh, sorry, I was just going to share a little story. Um, a client said maybe about a month ago, this client came in and it was his last session, actually. And he said, oh, do you know, um, thank you. You've helped me so much. And he was saying, you know, what was different in his life? And that was really nice. And then he said, but it's not just me that you've helped. And I wasn't sure what he meant. And he went on to say, well, you know, so many things that you say, I kind of I take away with me. And sometimes I write them down. And then when I meet up with my friends, and it was a male client um, and that felt particularly relevant because um, the men, obviously there's a lot more stigma around mental health with men in our society. Um, I said, oh, I go and I meet up with my friends and I tell them all of the things that you have taught me and all of the things that have helped me and I share that with them and it helps them too. And it was just such a lovely moment because that's, again, it's the ripple effect, isn't it? That Yes, definitely I don't realize and I was so grateful to him for telling me about it because it, it might happen all the time where people will share you know oh my therapist said this or I learned this in a mindfulness class or I saw this thing on Instagram or whatever and it helped me in this moment so it's really nice to know when you have made an impact because yeah you well, I put a lot of energy and effort into my work and it's you know, I don't need constant praise, but it's so nice to know when it is having an impact. Oh, definitely. It'll be very motivating because, you know, you you get all that positive energy to take forward to the next session. So that's great. I guess while you've done, you mentioned a lot of the positive things, there must be challenges on this journey as well. Are there any challenges that you can share and, you know, how you've surpassed them or overcome them? Mm. Yeah, there's lots of challenges. Um, I think especially when I first started out, lots of self-doubt, you know, do I know what I'm doing? Um, and all of that, which I think anyone starting any kind of business or project feels that. Um, and of course, still crops up, especially when I try something new, um, which is normal. So um, practicing what I preach, I suppose, with a lot of self-compassion <laughs> certainly helped a lot and letting myself do things imperfectly um, and just know what my intention is. And if my intention is good and I'm, you know, doing my best, then that's that's good enough. Um, I think probably, especially over the last few years, the biggest challenge for me, because I, I work on my own effectively, is the isolation. Uh, you know, sometimes... You know, I could spend a day with clients um, working through trauma and that's heavy stuff and that can be a lot to hold by myself. And so I don't hold it by myself. I make sure I have lots of supervision. I have colleagues, you know, who we don't work in the same business, you know, we're not employees together, but we might do something similar. I make a big effort to meet up with people um, and get out of the house and go and talk with people who run their own businesses, you know, who do similar things um, and share kind of that responsibility together because, yeah, it's, it's no good feeling isolated. I can't fix everything for everybody. And that would be, um, that's not helpful way of looking at things. So I think 
for anyone running a, a project, a charity, an organization, a business, being doing it solo is it's a lot. And so you need to kind of reach out and get support. And that's helped me immensely. Yeah. I think having a circle of support in whatever form or fashion, whether it's formalized, non-formal, informal, I think it's really helpful because then you have, you know, people who have with common interests, common uh, common ways to yeah. engage and I guess common ways to listen as well. I'm sure somebody like you would also need yeah. a good listener from time to time. <laughs> exactly. Yes. It's no good if it's just if I'm just holding everything. So um, I remember when we did um, when I did my training and we were talking about supervision, which is where a therapist can talk about their client work. So a lot, obviously a lot of what we do is um, confidential so that can make it tough to to talk about as well and and get that support. You can't kind of let off steam about your day in the same way, you know, I don't know if you work in marketing or something, <laughs> you might be able to. Um, so we have supervisors where we can talk, you know, the client's still, um, their identity is still hidden, but we can talk specifically about the work that we're doing. Um, and so without that, frankly, I think you'd go a bit mad yourself. And when, when I was doing my training, someone asked, you know, oh, so like, we have a supervisor and the supervisor has a supervisor. Where, where does it end? <laughs> said my colleague. And I remember um, our tutor just going, ah, with the great supervisor in the sky. <laughs> I like that. The great supervisor <laughs> in the sky. That's a very, very nice thought. Yeah. <laughs> How can interested people reach out to you and learn more? So um, I spend quite a bit of time hanging out on Instagram, probably more time than I should, but I actually really enjoy it on there. It's a lovely community. So um, I'm at Natalie Rossiter Wellbeing. So you can find me on there. I'm on Facebook too. Um, and my website, which is just natalierossiterwellbeing.co.uk. Um, you can find my email address on there. And I'm always very open to people just dropping into my inbox and saying hi um, and having a chat and looking at the various, I do as I've said, lots of different types of therapies and events and things like that. So lovely for people to get in touch because it's just me in my little office here. So it's always nice to hear from people. That sounds really good. Thank you. And I, I've always include your uh, website in, in my contact information, you know, in the podcast uh, contact information. Uh, uh, what advice would you have for people looking to start something similar in another part of the world or another part mm. of the UK, how should they get started? Well, I guess what I have done has sort of evolved organically. And actually someone contacted me recently to ask, you know, I'm interested in all these things, what shall I do? <laughs> um, so I think you've just got to kind of trust the process and um, find your own path with it. So I think just keep learning, um, always learning. So um, you can't do all of the trainings, you know, all at once, but find something you're interested in, focus on that, study it, practice it. Um, and as I said at the start, practice what you want to teach or, or whatever as well. It's got to come from that authentic place to try and immerse yourself in whatever it is that you're passionate about. And I think I would say to people to lean into their natural skills. So whilst we can learn things and, of course, hone our skills, my journey came from something that was just a part of who I am already. So not forcing something that doesn't really fit, you know, something I feel like I should do or that someone else has told me to do. So I think if you're passionate about something and you've got some kind of natural ability in it, just keep learning and trust the process, see where it goes. Um, let things be a bit squiggly and free flowing. You know, there's no direct sort of line, uh, you know, path to success whatever that might be um, and enjoy yourself enjoy that process I like that very much because you know that trust the process and enjoy it as well you know uh, it is going to be ups and downs but uh, there's going to be joy in yeah. it as well thank you for sharing that yeah you never know what it's going to lead on you know I didn't set you know you know in five years time I want to be teaching mindfulness another five years time I want to be doing forest therapy I didn't know that you know you kind of just got to go with it and see what comes up and kind of allow yourself to be pleasantly surprised by the twists and turns you know and you can be working really hard on something and you don't know 
whether anyone's listening or you know whether it's going to have any impact um and you just have to keep going i think if you believe in it if it's meaningful to you and if you can see that you're helping even one person then you have to be fueled by that positive experience and just know that good things take time as well and that's also so important right having the patience <laughs> to wait it out for that right time because the right time makes the patience that is definitely something i've had to learn <laughs> <laughs> Okay, an opportunity for you to talk about anything I haven't had a chance to ask you before I go to my signature questions. Mm, I think we've covered absolutely loads. Um, but just to remind people that have a calendar of year round events. So things like I think the next one, the next few things coming up is um, got a winter wellbeing workshop, which is a pay as you feel thing. Um, and will be recorded as well and, and go on my shop. So I know a lot of people struggle in winter. So if you're kind of listening to this, uh, interested in mental health your own and others um then just yeah check out see what's coming up and it'd be lovely to connect with people. thanks for sharing that and it sounds it sounds like a timely need with you know less sunlight around i i always say that one of the reasons i feel worse at winter is because i'm not seeing much sunlight when you're walking your dogs in the morning or the yeah. evening it's all dark isn't it so it's it yeah it makes a big difference it does make a difference. So now I come to my signature questions, which I ask all my guests. And my first one is, can you describe the Manchester spirit in a word or a phrase? Mm. I think Mancunians, well, I guess I'm um, thinking of the image of the bee and the worker bee. So industrious, um, which can be a benefit and also a downside, perhaps. But industrious, um, I think, kind of, yeah, salt of the earth sort of people. Um, sometimes rough, we can be a bit rougher on the edges, but hearts of gold, honest. Um, That's a lot of different. Fr I just wanted one, so I'm going to go with the <laughs> with the industrious. I think that that I'm is go. Yeah. that's a, that's a good one. Can you share a Mancunian who inspires you and tell us why? Oh, gosh. Um, and they could be living or dead. Yes. Well, that's convenient because I suppose the first one that came to mind, which is probably not very original, but she does inspire me often when I think of her, is Emmeline Pankhurst. Um, probably other guests have mentioned her or said her, but I don't mind that. Um, I think that kind of... Um, just fierce spirit, unrelenting spirit and, and living your values, knowing what's right and not giving up um, and yeah, bringing people together in that way, that courage that she had and that she inspired in others. So yeah, it's got to be Emmeline. No, actually, it's very interesting because these are new questions that I've introduced. Uh, what's the most important life lesson you've learned? I think probably it is to trust the process and I'm, I'm kind of smiling and sort of wanting to roll my eyes as well as I say it because when I did my training people used to tell me this all of the time to trust the process but I was in my early 20s and I was in such a rush to do everything and wanted to know how everything would turn out and do everything right all the time and all of that stuff. Um, and people used to tell me to trust the process and I found it really irritating um, <laughs> as a piece of advice. But now, so I'm 35 now and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, I would not, I now give people that annoying advice um, <laughs> myself. And I even on my last holiday, we went to Greece uh, earlier this year and I was in a shop and I saw it had trust the process written on this t-shirt and I just had to have it. And it was like an inside joke to myself, you know, that, me 10 years ago would have been like oh my god sake, I hate that t-shirt but it's it's really true you've just got to go with it there's no guarantees um and you've just got to yeah keep the faith and keep going that that is also such a relevant point you brought up because it you yeah. know it's right place right time and yeah. context is everything isn't it yeah. the same t-shirt if you had seen it maybe yeah. in your 20s you would have just said Oh yeah, no way. <laughs> so this is yeah. this is really true. And it's very relatable yeah. for anybody because as we as we 
grow in years and yeah, wisdom. Exactly. <laughs> we have different levels of maturity that come in, I think. <laughs> if you could have one superpower, what would that be? Hmm. One superpower. I was going to say to remove suffering, like with the click of a fingers, but actually I don't know if that would be it because whilst that's really tempting, sometimes we learn a lot and grow through our suffering. Um, so maybe not that. Um, I think actually what I would love to be able to do and for anyone to be able to do is to kind of to teleport themselves somewhere to be with the people they love whether they're in another country or many miles away um if I could just you know teleport myself down to London to be with my best friend or uh you know to be back on the beach in Greece or something like that um that would be fantastic you know I think it's that those missing connections sometimes we want to be somewhere and we can't just be there that would be so great if I could do that that does sound wonderful I'm going home to India after three and a half years it's my longest I've been away and uh, if I could go tomorrow by teleporting myself or today that would be yeah, even better to yeah. see family and friends in person and just to be able to hold sometimes mm. and you know you can do a little bit over zooms and other things but it's not quite the same not is the it? same yeah it'd be so amazing just to click your fingers and go over and have a cup of tea you know even if this super apparently lasted for half an hour or something <laughs> that would be a very precious half an hour and we'd all take it wouldn't we <laughs> oh i hope you have a wonderful visit when you get to go oh thank you is there a funny story you'd like to share with listeners so I decided to go for a walk um, in the park. I was wanting to kind of put some notes together for a talk that I'm giving at the Manchester Mindfulness Festival. So this is both work and Manchester related. And I, was, yeah, I wanted to get the creative juices flowing. So I went for a walk in this park. It was a lovely sunny afternoon. And I was headed towards these benches and I sat down. And I could see these three lads, I guess around 14 or something, that were stood next to this young poplar tulip poplar tree and there was something I was like mm, what's going on here with these guys why are they stood there next to this tree in this way there was just something a bit off about the situation so anyway I sit down I get my notes out start doing that and I've kind of got like half an eye on these boys and then yeah they start pulling the branches off the tree and I'm thinking oh god what am I going to do now? Like, except, you know, so connected to nature, it's so important to me. I can't just sit here and watch them do this. But also, like, my inner child was like, oh, my God, they're bullies. You can't go over there and talk to these boys. But I had to, so I got up and I thought, okay, I'm going to be mindful about it and not, like, yell at them, I suppose, in my judgmental mind. You know, I was thinking, what are these scally lads doing? You know, trashing this tree. It's kind of, yeah, these stupid kids. Um, but anyway, I went over to talk to them and told them, please don't do this. And of course, you know, they're just kind of like laughing to themselves. But to be fair, they weren't too uh, bad. And they didn't understand that the tree was alive. It was a living thing. So I was explaining that to them. And they were thinking, what the bloody hell are they teaching in schools? Like if, you know, you got to 14, you don't know a tree is alive. But um, anyway, they didn't know. And so now they do. Um, and I kind of said, well, you know, you can continue to destroy this tree um or which is really unkind or maybe you're better than that I don't know that's a choice that you can make and so I just walked away and thought I'm gonna leave it at that my heart was being out my chest I'm thinking oh god they're gonna come and steal my phone or like, I don't know something like just or something awful is gonna happen because of it I sat back down and I like at least tried to look calm and carried on with my notes and they kind of ran off and I was carrying on doing my work and then they came back like a few minutes later and I, I got like engrossed in my notes again. And they came with these branches that they'd ripped off, but that they collected up into like a kind of bouquet and then put them in front of me and went, oh, we, we brought you a present. And then I'm down and I'm, oh, um, <laughs> beautiful. And then, oh, and then like ran off <laughs> sniggering, but like, way rather than like aggressive way and it was such 
bizarre and random little interaction um, with some teenage boys, but it kind of actually was quite useful because I think I might include it in my talk, um, <laughs> which is about conversations. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean, who knows what they will take from that interaction? Um, couldn't possibly say, but you know, it's something that could have. Like if I'd yelled at sweet. them or something, I guess it could have gone very differently. Or if I'd said nothing, yeah. um, that could have gone differently as well. So I was quite happy with the outcome. You know, who knows what I'll say they will actually take from that. But it was kind of sweet how it ended. No, I really like it because it it shows that even you know sometimes just speaking <laughs> up, one voice can make a difference, isn't it? It is very sweet, and while it's not the most funniest story, it is a very sweet story. So I will, I'll definitely include it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Natalie. It's been a real pleasure, and I've learned a little bit about mindfulness and forest therapy. And the next time I go out to nature again, I'm going to have a little think about, you know, so I'll think about biophilia because uh, I'm definitely fascinated by different things. And maybe it's my inner child or my outer child, I can't say. <laughs> uh, but it was it was really nice to talk to you. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. Natalie, thank you for talking to me and my listeners. I really enjoyed learning about forest therapy today. Dear listener, thank you so much for listening to the second episode of the Meet the Mancunian podcast season four. I hope this episode and the podcast itself encourages you to follow your passions, inspired by the amazing Mancunian guests who feature here. Tune in every Tuesday for a new episode or log on to www meetthemancunian.co.uk to listen to all the episodes and learn more about my podcasting story. Next week on Tuesday, 6th December 2022, the Meet the Mancunian podcast talks to Yvonne Hope about homelessness. Please do leave a review or a voice message on my website www.meetthemancunian.co.uk takes only a few minutes. Thank you so much.